everyone chooses one of two directions in their life. One is the well-traveled road to mediocrity, high stress, busyness, and a poverty mentality. The other road leads to purpose, to greatness, and to wealth. The path of mediocrity stifles human potential. The lower path of mediocrity is a quick fix, shortcut approach to life. Those on the lower path to mediocrity live out the cultural software of ego, indulgence, scarcity, comparison, competitiveness, and finally, victimization. On the outside, their lives seem large, but on the inside, they suffer in every aspect of their lives. On the other hand, the path to greatness is a process of sequential growth from the inside out. Those who take the road to greatness rise above the negative cultural influences and choose to become the dominant creative force in their lives. Two roads diverged in the wood. I took the road less traveled by, and that made all the difference. From the Road Less Traveled by Robert Frost. You are here. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. 9,999 out of every 10,000 children swiftly and inadvertently are geniusized, degeniusized by grown-ups. I realize money isn't everything, but you either control it or it controls you. And from George Klassen's The Richest Man in Babylon, one of my favorite quotes, a lean purse is easier to cure than endure. So when we speak of the seven keys to double your net profit, the only true growth is growth in net profit. If you're going to double your net profit, how would you do it? Where would you start? The first thing you do is get your head right. You're going to take in 25 to 50 million or more in revenues in your lifetime. The most important key is your attitude and beliefs about money, your practice, and your life. And as I've often said, if profit is not the economic motive, then all that will happen is that you'll end up chasing your expenses. So there are a couple fatal assumptions that the culture has embedded in our minds. The first is that production equals wealth, which is nothing of the kind. The second is you can run your practice on an accounting statement. I promise you, if you run your practice on an accounting statement, you will die broke. I promise you or that you can run your practice on the seat of the pants management. Wealth is not the same as income. If you make a good income each year and spend it all, you aren't getting wealthier. You're just living high. Wealth is what you accumulate, not what you spend from the millionaire next door. So the first type of practice, one of the most common practices, is what we call the lifestyle or the consumption-based practice. The second is the money center. And you know a money-centered practice is because all they ever talk about is production, and you know it's never enough. This is what a production-centered practice looks like. We call it a treadmill. This is from an actual dentist, who may even, by the way, be on this call. Started out in 1991, built the practice up to about 1999, when it was somewhere over 500000 got involved with a typical commodity consultant, and the practice drove the practice up to one. 2 million. So by all sense uh, of normal American ego and culture, this is a great practice. The only problem is that the net profit flatlined. So here's a dentist that's trading time for dollars. The third style of practice is the wealth creator type practice that we talk about. It's value and patient-centered. This practice model can create wealth in 120 months or less. Here's an example of two dentists who started in 1990, and this is a 10-year run in this practice where their overhead went or from 65 to 51 percent, and their increase in net profit per year was 150,000 all the way up to over 200,000, which in a 10-year period for two dentists was 1,941,000. And what I often tell people is you can expect working in this model that your net profit will increase someplace between 600 to a million dollars in 10 years. So here are the three core business elements, the, the three core uh, keys. One is money, getting control of money. The second is time, 
and the third is systems and organization. These are the three key elements that are absolutely foundational to the success of any business. So I'm going to start with money, and today I'm probably going to spend a little bit more time here, but I want to talk about money because if this was your life, this first uh, can or bucket represents all the money you're going to take in in your life, the total amount of revenues that you generate. But then we start extracting or subtracting from that amount. So whatever this number is in your lifetime, the biggest expense that you'll have for most people is in running their own business, the fixed and variable expenses. But then we have to add the personal. The personal, both fixed and variable, go with personal. And then we have to add the taxes. And lastly, if there's anything left, there's savings and investments. So if we really look at this, and really think about this seriously, you see that this is really a total system. That because you own your own business, your own practice, you really can't separate yourself from your business. And you really can't separate the business from yourself. And you really, the tax man is always there. And if you don't really look at this as an entire system, what will happen is you'll just continue to push on increasing your production but your expenses will go up, your lifestyle will go up, you don't pay attention to the taxes, and you get to be about 50 or 55 years of age, and you finally wake up and say, you know, I only got 10 or 15 years left, but I've only been, managed to save maybe three or four or five hundred thousand dollars in that first 30 years of practice. So as we look at this, we talk about unless you're determined to control money in your life, nothing else makes much sense. So here's a control model. This actually was created by the Bennett brothers, and I think it's a great model because it goes over here on the left side and it says, what do you need, what do you want, and what do you believe is going to get you what you want? And so I add in here principles because it's not just opinions, because I can have a lot of opinions and a lot of beliefs, but I could be wrong. But if my beliefs are centered in principles, then I'm going to create structure in my life rules, regulations, and guidelines that are going to modify, that are going to influence, that are going to impact my behavior so I can get a different set of results. Another person suggested so eloquently in the fifth discipline, Peter Senye, said structure, which is the rules, regulations, and guidelines, determines patterns of uh, behavior, which determines results. Now, if you take a look at a big picture, all of this here is your pro practice profit planning, which represents all the money that it, co it costs you to run your practice. You notice the range is 45 to 55, never over 55%. Because you're going to live on, and remember, we've looked at thousands of financial statements of dentists, thousands of them. We look at uh, a bunch of them every month. And uh, typically, a dentist will spend, of the gross collections, someplace between 25 all the way up to 35% of the dollars that are collected. So if your practice is, has a 65% overhead and you're living on 30 or 35%, you can see there's little or no, nothing left here. So why do we do percentage budgeting? Percentage budgeting is one of the keys strategies because it's an abundance, not a, it creates an abundance, not a scarcity mentality. It allows you to make value clarification about where do you want your money to go rather than reacting to where it went. It is creative, not reactive with money. It puts you in control. It gives you the freedom and it gives you, provides a sense of security and self-confidence and enables you, when you understand where the money is and where it's going, it enables you to make good financial decisions. So one of the first things we always do when we ever interact with anyone and look at anything, we take everything that happens on an accounting sheet, a P&L sheet, and we put it into these eight categories. Doctor's compensation, staff compensation, occupancy, equipment, and human development costs, professional supplies, marketing, lab fees, and administration expense. Now, then you take a look and say, well, this is where your actual dollars are going, and what's the variance between yours and the actual budget. Now, I'm not saying that these percentages should be your budget. Each one of you would ultimately and has to ultimately make your own budget. 
But if you start out with a budget and you know what it is, then you can make good decisions. And as I said before, as long as you use traditional accounting methods, you can be sure that you're losing at least a million in net profit every 10 years or somewhere around $100,000 a year. I call this P&L disease. Then you need to create a home budget so that at least you know where the money's going at home. I'm not a quick an addict that is to, to monitor every penny, but I'd like to have an idea where the money's going to check it at least on a quarterly basis. So if we look at this and we say, well, okay, so here's a financial model. We say that 52%, maximum 55% of all the monies that come into your practice go to operate the cost of your practice. In our model, we suggest 24, 25% should go to pay me, the doctor, as the technician delivering the dentistry. So if it's 52 and 24, that leaves me 10% for solvency money I put in reserve to protect the business. We call that a power or freedom account. 10% is ROI because after all, I invested all this money to build this business, the practice, and so I'm expecting that I'm going to get 10% back from that, and this is additional profit. The reality is all of this is potential profit. And this is why I think that professional people so mismanage their businesses, because you have a, a potential of 48% for total profit, including owner salaries. Most restaurants and businesses operate someplace in the neighborhood of 8 to 10% profit, including owner salaries. So as we look at this, we say, okay, in each one of these areas, it's kind of like a pie chart. All the money comes in and all of it gets allocated into individual areas so that we have some idea about where this money's going. But the reality is what we see most, most commonly, and remember we punch these in and look at these, I'd say we look at five or six a week, maybe 20 of them a month, 25 a month. And so we see here, what we see so often is in most practices that aren't using the models that we teach here, 95% of all dollars coming in are already pre-spent. And that's a small margin for error. So we talk about these three lines. The red line is made up of total overhead plus doctor's salary. This would be considered the break-even or the level that you must collect to survive the business would be suffering from insolvency at any point below the red line. Then the blue line is really 10% more than the red line. In other words, this is the total of all the costs plus the doctor's salary plus 10%. In other words, now we're going to have solvency of 10% more than collections to put into a power account or what we are more commonly call, calling today a freedom account. And the last 10% is the green line is made up of total overhead plus doctor's salary plus solvency plus ROI funds. And at this point, we've truly met all the expenses when all the ROI funds are available above and beyond solvency. If they're not, you've simply met the necessary expenses without contributing to the future. So here we're aiming for the green line. And my coaches and staff always remind me, you can't get to green line with red line fees. So this would be, represent the survival line. Now obviously it's not a straight line because it varies from week to week and month to month, but as this line goes up, the blue line goes up, the green line goes up, as it goes down, as the costs go down, the blue line comes down, the financial independence line comes down. So I often say, and people kind of get upset with this language, I often say that high production practices, what you see is a lot of really insane dentists because they, they keep pushing and pushing this line up. Their expenses get higher and higher because they're trying to produce more and more and it makes the uh, capability of getting to solvency and financial independence more and more difficult. So this really represents another look at the flow of money. So what we're really thinking about is how can we control the flow of money? So we're saying, okay, someplace between 35 as an endodontist, potentially an oral surgeon not doing implants, to 55% being a general dentist or restorative dentist uh, doing a lot of restorative dentistry, maybe a prosthodontist, 
And then the doctor's compensation, someplace about 25 to 30 percent of gross revenues. And then obviously the bottom can be any place between 15 to 30 percent of money that's put away for savings and investments. Now, so it could be put in the power account, it could be put in a pension account, or both, however it's allocated. So the power account is a freedom account. And I've been saying for years, control equals profit, profit equals power, but power equals freedom. My good friend Bill Lockhart, I think who's even on this uh, webinar, added this to it years ago as he became a student of mine at the center. Unless you have excess monies or securities, you can't operate from a position of power. Without power, your environment controls you. With power, you control your environment. So the power account or the freedom account is a planned amount of money accumulated by the practice to allow its economic strength to expand, to grow, and develop new resources, thereby ensuring continuous growth and survival. So you can divide the, this account into, okay, so you have a solvency account. If you're planning new equipment, you put money in an equipment account. And you put money in your pension account. And obviously, we've got to put money away in our taxes account. And if we're planning any kind of expansion, we're putting money away for that as well. This could all be in one account, but if you kept an Excel spreadsheet, you could allocate different amounts of money to different aspects. So I'm not advocating that you have five different accounts at the bank. So if we look at a yearly profit plan, and we say, okay, and as an example, when I lectured at the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry a couple of years ago, I used this number, 800,000, which many of you realize is not an overly large practice in today's day and age. Thinking about this, we're allocating $200,000 to live at home, $416,000 to operate the practice, thinking about $80,000 for taxes, but in this model we're putting $70,000 away in a pension environment and $34,000 away in personal investments outside a pension plan. Uh, you know, in my estimation, anybody that's grossing above $800,000 can easily and comfortably in this model put away $100,000 a year which in effect is what you need to put away to ever be able to reach financial independence. So your wealth plan includes a home budget, a practice budget, a tax budget, a retirement budget, a savings budget, a children's education budget. So here's a cash flow report. And in this cash flow report, I recommend that you put down the amount at the beginning of the month or any time period of the amount of cash that you have on hand. And that this is the amount you're estimating to collect, so now it's your total cash available. Subtract the bills to be paid, which of course we're going to get from the budget, and this is the ending amount of cash flow. So there's five key numbers that you need to monitor very closely. How much is coming in? That's your collections. How much is going out? That's your expenses. How much do you owe? That's your payables. How much is owed you? That's your receivables. And of course, how much cash do you have on hand? So if we look at the relationship of overhead to net, if we're, gonna, if we're looking at how are we going to double our net profit, if you require a net income of $20,000 a month and your overhead goes from 50 to 65% to increase in staff, larger office, purchase of new equipment, what's the percentage increase in production required to net the same $20,000? Is it 5%, 10%, 15%, 25%? Now, it's 43%, and this is how most dentists, most dentists, I'd say 80% of dentists, enter the rat race. So if we look at this, <laughs> you look down here at 50%. To net 50, you need to collect 50, 100. At 55%, to net 50, you need to collect 111. That's 11% 11 more. That's not too bad. At, at um, 60% overhead, you need to collect 125 to net 50. Now you're working 25% more. Another day a week to net the same. Seeing how many more patients to net the same. At 65%, we start to get into the area of insanity. Now you've got to produce 43% more to net the same as you did when you were at 50%. Now, so now you're working 43% more. At 70%, this is when our phone rings off the hook or should, at 70%, you've got to produce 66% more. You've got to work two-thirds more to net the same than you would have at 50%. So you can see 
that there's a, a correlation between high growth, high overhead practices, and busyness and borderline insanity. And I'm also going to say to you, there's a direct correlation between high overheads and low quality of dentistry. There's a direct correlation between high production and low case acceptance on the part of patients. So now I want to move into the second key, or second driving force, which is time, which is actually such a key element. And in many cases, it's probably more important than time. And so in everything that we do, in everything we teach, embedded in it is the 80-20 principle or Pareto's law. And I like to say most strategies have little effect, a few can transform your life. This was developed by Alfredo Pareto in 1906. 80-20 means that in anything, a few, that is 20%, and it could be less, are vital, and the many are trivial. A small number of causes account for 80% of your results. 20% of the people he discovered in Italy had 80% of the wealth. Jo and Joseph Duran, one of the quality control experts, said 20% of the defects are always caused, cause 80% of the problems. Now, it could be 10% of the defects cause 90% of the problem. 20% of your work consumes 80% of your time and resources. 20% of what you do produces 80% of your results. Focus 80% of your time and energy on 20% of your work that's really important. 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers or patients. 80% of the problems come from 20% of your patients. 20% of your patients account for 80% of your sales volume. 80% of traffic pollution is caused by 20% of vehicles. 20% of advertising yields 80% of your campaign results. 80-20 with money. You've got an 80-20 with your time, with sales, with marketing, with patients, with staff, and I would say with your mix of services. 80% of the money spent on marketing is wasted. The problem is we don't know what the 80% is if we're not identifying it. 20% of your advertising yields 80% of your results. 6% of cola drinkers consume 60% of all colas. Half a percent of customers rent 25% of the cars. 10% of long-distance callers make 55% all long-distance calls. No one has the time and energy or resources to tackle everything that needs doing. And you, like me, have more opportunities than you have time for. Choose wisely. Be conscious about your choices. We talk about fourth generation of time management. Producing more in less time. 20% of your procedures, like I said, yield 80% of your production. 20% of your patients yield 80% of your results. 20% of your time yields 80% of your results. And, and when I work with specialists, endodontists and oral surgeons included, they say that applies to me as well. So we advocate that you block schedule your A, B, and C time. Your A time is the highest and best use of your time. Your B time is the planning and the time that you need to do to be able to do A. And you notice I don't have any C time here because C is a waste of your time. So you block schedule your recreation time. That's even outside the office. My recommendation, and I know I get a lot of flack about this, but my recommendation is that you not work more than 25 clinical hours a week. If you can't get it in 25 hours, you're not going to get it. Find the balance. Find the happy place in your life. To have more time, you have to do less. The older you get, the faster time goes. That's relativity. Take time to pray, to meditate, and be grateful. Start your day with at least 50 minutes of exercise. So fourth generation time management. What are the strengths and what are the weaknesses? The strengths of fourth generation is it takes responsibility for life. You take responsibility for life balance. Relationships become more important than financial success. Focus on what is most important in the key roles of your life. Discipline, commitment, and the focus on life balance, body, mind, and spirit. The weaknesses, there are none, because you have improved communication with people, because you're spending more time, you're better prepared, you block schedule not only your practice, but your life. You have far better organi 
organizing and planning. You take better care of yourself. You're able to seize new opportunities and you experience life balance. That's the second core key strategy. The third is organization. How do organizations grow? People in organizations grow by releasing greater energy in themselves, improving their knowledge, acquiring new skills, changing their attitudes, and committing themselves to their values and a higher purpose. How you organize and what you deliver and how the systems integrate together is the key to growth. It's how you organize and energize each building block that determines how you feel about your success. Organization is the least appreciated and least understand, understood of the seven keys to double your net profit. Orga organization and systems contain the deepest secrets and are the greatest unutilized potential for growth. Organization is highly creative. Creativity in combining the elements together to, ge to generate growth and new profits. Without organization, the creative energy of the other six building blocks could never be realized. So the three building blocks, four building blocks of an organization, of an organization are positions. Positions are grouped in roles, duties, and responsibilities. Activities. Hundreds of individual acts are linked together to more major and minor productive activities of production, cost control, sales, marketing, assisting, and service. The systems are the mechanism which an organization uses to link activities with each other and link activities with positions. Organization and systems possess an amazing power for ease of workflow and growth. I'd like you to remember that systems aren't dead or mechanical devices. They derive their power directly from the practice values such as organization, excuse me, orderliness, punctuality, coordination, excellence, and ethical virtue. The true source of any practice's energy, growth, and creativity doesn't lie in any single building block but the real energy is generated by the relationship between these elements. The real power of organizations and systems arises from the capacity for coordination and integration of people, activity, and systems. The ultimate secret is freedom is the essential ingredient for growth. The individual grows only in freedom, but the practice, on the other hand, is based on order, predictability, and stability. Freedom without organization and discipline is chaos. Discipline without freedom is tyranny. The ultimate is balance between freedom, responsibility, and discipline. Establish clear job description, clear expectations and guidelines for every position, and create a system whereby the responsibilities and authority of each position are clear to everyone in your practice. Use each staff meeting to analyze the effectiveness of each building block. Analyze the effectiveness of each role in your practice. Marketing, your referral system, your case presentation, how you deliver care, the staff engagement, your patient's response. I'm going to talk a few moments about marketing. The market. You've got to prepare the patient, but first you have to prepare yourself. We get calls constantly from people that want to market their practice. Marketing is really very simple. You make a bold promise, and then you deliver it. But if you don't have the core that has money, time, and system in, in place, you can't deliver the promise anyway. So the market is your offering. How do the people hear about you? Who are they anyway? What do they want? What do you want? And is there a match between what they want and you want? Internal marketing systems must be in place before external marketing will be effective. If you don't have the first three elements in place, money, time, and organization, you can't deliver what you're marketing anyway. So the market is, we ask the question, do you have a purple cow? What's unique about what you do? What do your A patients say about you? What do your A referral sources say about you? 
and how do you grow your A patients? And how do your A patients grow you? I'm going to spend a moment on the sales uh, key, but it's very complicated, but it can be broken down into something relatively simple. Co-discover with the patient what the situation is. Co-diagnose with the patient the problem or problems that the patient has. What are the implication of the problems or problems that the patient has? Co-design solutions with the patient and then deliver the solution. It's one of the more difficult things that you work with, but it is the single most powerful driving force for growth. And people. Every person that ever comes to work for any of us wants these seven questions answered. Why am I here? What's the purpose of this place anyway? Where are we going, doctor? Where are we headed? That's leadership. How do things work around here? That's systems. What do you expect of me? What responsibilities do I have? Where do I go for help if I need help? Who's going to support me? Who's going to coach me as I learn what to do here? How am I doing? How do you give me feedback? What kind of feedback do I get? Do I get it daily? Do I get it weekly? How do I know how I'm doing? What's in it for me? That is the rewards. What are the payoffs for me when I come to work for you? People are so important to the success of any business. You've got to have the right people. And you could have the right people, the right person, but not in the right role. You've got to have the right person in the right role with the right attitude, with the right fit, does this person fit with what you're attempting to do with your practice, with the right structure and the right rewards. The biggest difference between an average practice, and remember 80% of all the dental practices in the United States aren't even average, they're mediocre. 15% are average. The biggest difference between a mediocre or average practice and a great practice is the motivation of its people. They're inspired, they're engaged, they love their work, it's a vital key to growth. And last but not least is purpose. Purpose is your primary aim. Purpose is your reason for being. Purpose is the reason you get up in the morning. Purpose is everyone needs a reason to get up and living and practicing from the inside out, not the outside in. So here's a questionnaire for you to think about. Do you feel a sense of balance in your life? Do you regularly enjoy belly laughs? That is, are you having fun? Do you live out your dreams? Do you take time for solitude? Do you have at least three nutritious people in your life? And I just reached over to Pat Barb because she's one of the nutritious people in my life. Do you feel the energy of optimum health? Do you feel that your life matters? Does your recreation time really recreate you? Do you have the courage to say no? And do you have a spiritual practice in your life? Purpose, a shift in intention changes your entire game. If your purpose and your objective is growth, then your prime focus is on how you create value for your patients and your referral sources. What you think, feel, and see determines what you get. The universe works in this way. I've worked with dentists and dental practices since 1974 when I first began teaching at the Panky Institute. I've been involved with the greatest minds who, and studied business organizations for more than 30 years. All of these people approach growing a business from the inside out, not the outside in. So I don't know what stage of your practice life that you're in. I don't know, most of you aren't in startup, that is, you haven't yet gone into the marketplace. I don't know how many of you are in entry. Entry is the period of time that you go from startup right to what we refer to as the break-even point here. 
I don't know if you're in growth. And remember, the true growth is always represented by a, not necessarily a growth in, pro, growth in production, but a growth in net profit of 15 to 20 percent per year. These are very difficult times. And every business ultimately goes through a midlife crisis. It reaches this period of a plateau. And if you stay in practice long enough, that if you're in practice for 20, 30, or 40 years, you're going to find that you're going to go through this life cycle three or four times. You're going to, you're going to get into growth, and then you're going to get a little bit lazy. The internal structures of your practice change. The external environment changes, and it throws you into uh, a midlife crisis or decline. George Land refers to this as breakpoint. Breakpoint is you get at this point and you either begin to grow again through innovation of new systems, new structure, inputting new energy into your practice, or you continue the long and gradual decline. So if we look at this, this is one way to look at it. And I put it together like this because it's very difficult to work only with money and not impact time. And so what do we say in the American culture? Time is money. You know, it's very difficult to think about time and money without thinking about how we organize our business or what the people do that are in our practice. How do they work? And really, as I mentioned already, there's a big emphasis on external marketing, but I've said until you build the inside of it, you can't even deliver what you're promising anyway. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose that you made a promise that your patients would never wait. Okay? Let's say that you said to your patients, if you wait more than 10 minutes, okay, that's a promise, that I'll pay for your appointment. Well, that's a great promise, but you better have the internal organization and the people and the time under control, don't you think, or that'll never happen. So this whole process is one of integration. I've represented it this way for most of my uh, life as I developed this model of building a practice myself and the team here at the center. And I always believe that you have to start with a purpose, a vision, or mission. And of course, most of us don't. But you have to have some idea of what this thing's going to look like when it's finished. What is the size of it? How many patients will you be seeing? What will you be doing? What kind of care are you going to be delivering? Are you going to deliver piecework? Are you going to do quadrant care? Are you going to do more comprehensive care? What will it look like? What will your patients look like when they leave the practice? So that's a great place, but few of us coming out of dental school have the knowledge have, to even have a, have a vision or a purpose or a mission. We don't have enough advanced training to even create it. So I like to say, for most people, this is really a responsibility continuum. To the degree that you take responsibility for money in your life is the degree that you can advance to taking responsibility for time in your life and for building the organization and building your practice how you deliver what you deliver. In fact, I will say to you, how you deliver what you deliver is more important to the patients than what you deliver. In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to interview a man who's opened two hamburger places in Scottsdale in the last year. And this is a very troubled area. I mean, we're in a deep recession here in Scottsdale. He opened a, a little a hamburger stand. And do we really need more hamburgers? Do we really need a few more dentists out of your corner? But he opened a hamburger stand called the Blue Burger, and he's killing it. In fact, he's just opened another one in the last month. And it isn't really the fact that he's selling hamburgers that it's important. It is how they deliver what they deliver. It isn't what they do. It's how they do it. And that's what organization is all about. I call this the holy triad, money, time, and organization. Once you really have those three things really in place, you really have worked on all the systems that go with this, now you're in a position to really market something. Well, what are you going to market? Well, you've got to have some promise. You've got to have something special or different. And the whole issue of how you communicate with patients, your process, your new patient process, as I said before, is the most critical and the most important process that you do. But if you don't have the time to do it, if you don't have the knowledge to do it and skills to do it, it's never going to happen. And so the other area is the issue of people, team, and synergy. So what I like to say is this. These lower 
three core elements or keys are building the foundation. These keys, marketing and sales, people and vision and mission, are what drive the growth of the practice. So, what I wanted to say is this. To all of you, and many of you are already getting help here, many of you are already clients of ours, and so this is a really good refresher for you, but some of you aren't. If you, wanna, if you want help, we're here to help you. We'll email you a short questionnaire to fill out, return to us. Either myself or Corbin Reeves or Carlton Hawkins will set up a time, a private one-on-one -on -one discussion about where you are and where you want to go. I'm wishing you all the best. I'm ready for questions if any of you have them. And we're here to help if you want help. And I hope you got a lot out of this time together. that you would like to ask Dr. Schuster, um, you can certainly type those questions in um, as we are not able to hear any of you. Um, so you're going to need to type those in, but we will be able to see those um, on our screen and we will address those questions. Somebody what? I'm sorry we're not able to see the question. Um, I do see that somebody has their hand raised. If you can type down in the chat box, we're able to see that. You can type in your question. Can we uh, get it so they can speak to us? Um, let me see if I can do that. So what I, what they should do uh, is e okay, here we go. Okay. They should email any question to me. Muted. Uh, Barb. Okay. Um. <laughs> I think she's talking to me. Hello, Dr. Schuster. Yeah, is this Michael? Yes, it is. Hello. Go ahead. Do you have a question, Michael? Oh, I just got in, and Lauren's been listening since four o'clock, and she. I just walked in now, uh, since five o'clock, and, and I just walked in. We're wondering if this is available on a transcript. Uh, no, but it's available. Uh, we'll have to check it. We'll ch we're going to check the recording, Michael, and then we'll be it'll be available as a recording. Okay. Okay. I just came home. Lauren's been taking notes for an hour. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Anybody else?
seeing a lot of wonderful people there that I've been blessed to work with over these past many years. It's good, good to see so many of you on the uh, on the webinar. It's great. Thanks for coming. Okay, if anybody has a special question or anything after this, uh, please feel free to email me at Mike, M-I-K-E, at C, Charlie, Frank, F, P, Papa, D, Delta, dot com. Mike at CFPD.com. I'll be in tomorrow, and I'll be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you for being here. Thanks for listening.